This is LBC News. Now let's turn to uh, the build-up to COP27, uh, which gets underway tomorrow in Egypt. Uh, the head of the United Nations, though, ahead of that, has warned the world is doomed unless a historic pact is signed between rich and poor countries. Antonio Guterres has spoken to The Guardian on the eve of the summit. It starts in Sharm el-Sheikh. And he's defended his use of dramatic language, saying the world is approaching tipping points that will make climate breakdown irreversible. Uh, well, let's bring in Dr. Rupert Reed, a climate and environmental campaigner and professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia. Good afternoon, Dr. Rupert. Good afternoon, Aaron. May I first off just say I th- I'm fully behind what Antonio Guterres is saying here. He is absolutely right. And that's why my latest book is called Why Climate Breakdown Matters, because this is what we are on the on the very precipice of, or indeed in the early stages of now. Well, well you've answered my first question. Do you agree with him? And and also, uh, I mentioned your book as well, so two and one there. Um, look, we, we ought to say... Um, uh, COP26 in Glasgow, it, it appeared that a lot was achieved. There were lots of pledges and promises, and I know that those aren't always completely binding. But is COP27 arguably more important, though, because now it's up to um, politicians to be nailed down to those pledges? Because clearly the stories we've seen this week, it's obvious progress is needed. Well, I'm afraid my take is a slightly different one, Aaron. I was at COP26 and I was not impressed. And I spoke out very clearly about this at the time. All we got at COP26 was promises, was what my friend and colleague Greta Tumbo calls blah, blah, blah. And so it's really no surprise that here we are a year later and we're in, if anything, an even worse situation. The bottom line here is that the world's citizens have to recognise that governments are not going to sort this or at any rate, that governments are not going to sort this until they're given an enormous kick up the backside by citizens. There is no point in trying to outsource this issue to our governments because they are not going to sort this at COP27. The clue is in the name, COP27. There have been 27 years of this, and the this, this situation has continued to deteriorate. So we, we really need to be very clear that Guterres has said it absolutely straight up, and we need to be very clear that unless we do something about it unless we stop outsourcing and start taking some responsibility the future will look grimmer and grimmer but the argument would be that collecting politicians action groups in in one place and i understand take your point about it being 27 the same was said it's 26 and there's been 25 before this one Uh, but i mean egypt are are, uh, certainly intending to try and implement those pledges and that's about getting cash isn't it Uh, getting wealthy nations to follow through on their pledges Uh, you're saying that that just won't happen yeah, I'm saying that it just won't happen. The only conceivable circumstance under which it, it could start to happen is if there is a far greater upsurge from citizens, from parents, from workers, from all of us, making clear that we are not satisfied with just endless blah, blah, blah. You see, the problem, Aaron, is that, as you say, quite a lot of people perceived last year's COP conference as successful, but it really wasn't. It was, it was much less successful than the most successful ever COP in 2015 the Paris COP, and that put us on a path which people, which nations have just not been going down. And until we get a lot more serious about trying to turn this around, then nothing is going to change. And I'll say something else on this as well, that it's past time when we can actually leave it up to our leaders to do this. We have to start taking responsibility ourselves. I'm talking about things like local community action. I'm talking about things like people growing more food where they live, about organizations such as county councils, businesses, all kinds of institutions, professions, taking this into their own hands because our so-called leaders are just not doing so. And I'm afraid the only real advantage as far as I'm concerned in having COP27 is that it gives us an opportunity to state these bitter truths. Well, and it also um, leads to uh, um, many disturbing stories that seem to get into the news agenda in the week leading up to and during COP26 or 27, as it will be this yeah. week. We saw this week uh, that the glaciers, many of them around the world in lots of different countries, uh, will disappear by 2050. This is what the UN report said, and that is regardless of what we do to to tackle the climate problem. So nothing we will do will change that, which means that all of Africa's 
glaciers will be gone by, by 2050. Do you think those sorts of stories um, are, are, are the kind that can cap- capture the public's imagination and get people to do things in their local areas? Yeah, I think so. And it is about waking people up uh, and getting people to understand how bad the situation is. I understand that people don't want an endless stream of bad news, but we really still haven't quite taken in just how serious the situation is and what it means for us. So the melting of those glaciers is going to be terrible news for many people in Africa and Asia. That's going to have worldwide ramifications. But before that even happens, we are going to crash through the safe barrier for maximum climate change globally of 1.5 degrees. This was the um, the number that was agreed in the last few years by governments as if we stay below this, then we're more or less going to manage to keep ourselves safe. We will stop those kind of runaway feedback effects, for example, that Guterres is rightly warning about. But we're not going to stay below 1.5 degrees. The Economist, no less, has called it this week. If you look on the front p- cover of the Economist magazine, you'll see 1.5 is dead. Alok Sharma last year, COP20 26 president famously said we must keep 1.5 alive and 1.5 is still alive though its pulse is weak it's not alive any longer we are going to exceed 1.5 governments have categorically let us down here and this truth needs to be understood because only when people realize just how much how much SHIT we are in, will people start, I think, to actually pull together and respond in the kind of ways I've been gesturing at. So com- building community resilience, actually upping the pressure drastically on our politicians to move far more seriously on this crisis. So that's the reality check I'm here to deliver today, Aaron. Do not expect COP27 to save you. It just is not going to do so. And what this is instead a moment for is for us to, to realise, oh my God, the promises that were made to us, they're not being delivered on. We're not going to be kept safe. We have to start to take these matters into our own hands. Yeah, it is uh, some stark language, but perhaps you're exactly right that that is what's needed. A tipping point is what Guterres said, and uh, we thank you very much yeah. uh, for coming on and, and, and giving us your analysis on the situation. That's Dr. Rupert Reid there, climate and environmental campaigner and uh, professor of philosophy at University of East Anglia. Thank you very much.